the bottom line in business. Voice America Business. Welcome to CIO Talk Radio with your host, Sunjo Gall. All comments, views, and opinions expressed on this show are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers. Here's Sunjo Gall. Good morning and uh, welcome to CIO Talk Radio. To learn more about the show, please visit www.ciotalkradio.com. Today's topic is realigning IT in a downturn to get an upturn. Our guests for today's show are uh, Patricia Coffey. Uh, she's the executive board member of Society of Information Management, and she's also the vice president of distribution marketing and enterprise applications with Allstate Insurance Company. Hi, Pat. How are you? I'm fine. Hi. How are you doing? I think you are in Orlando. I am in Orlando at the uh, tail end of the SIM annual conference. Yes, I am. So it's good fun, huh? Yes, absolutely. Great conference as well. Great. So we also have Leo Collins, who is the Vice President of Advocacy and Communities of Interest for Society of Information Management, and he's also the Chief Information Officer with Lionsgate Entertainment. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. Yeah, we did. We I think missed you at the conference, but I think you're enjoying the California weather. <laughs> it is very nice today. Yep. So while while the weather is good in Orlando and in California, but the economic weather is something which is of concern to most of us here. And what we are trying to do as IT leaders is to stand by our executive management to see how things can be improved. Now, if it comes down to IT, which is truly becoming strategic to business, and I'm sure uh, the executive management actually recognizes it, we should we be actually uh, risking by uh, the, the, the overall strategy that we have put in place by cutting the budgets rather soon as soon as we see any hiccup in the economy, economy and uh, also if we are to do the same thing in any other business function, would that be allowed in, in normal circumstances? So, Pat, what do you think? Well, you know, Sanjo, I think, you know, what's interesting is the uh, SIM annual uh, survey of CIOs, which will be out shortly, is showing that um, this downturn, I think executives are really taking a different point of view and aren't saying, you know, cut, cut, cut the IT expense. Instead, um, you know, maybe IT is our way to become more efficient as a business, and we need to be very careful if we're cutting our IT expense. Maybe if we have some inefficiency within IT, that's one thing, but to stop those strategic projects um, it really just hurts us. And, um, and from, from my perspective and from our company, we also want to make sure we're well positioned coming out of the downturn um, and maybe learn some lessons of the cuts of the past that you know, companies that cut too soon you know, really aren't well positioned to take advantage when the uptick comes. And uh, I'm an optimist, and I believe the uptick will come. <laughs> Leo, what do you think? I very much agree. I think that the business now recognizes that IT is one of the most strategic building blocks of any company. Um, at least that's the way it is in this industry that I'm in. You know, maybe the bar has changed as to how cautious we are at certain investments and whether or not investments going to have a payoff in the relatively near future. But they understand that, you know, without your basic infrastructure or without your strategic applications, it's very difficult to compete in this environment. So we're seeing a lot of support for the strategic activities, and we're just being cautious about what else we add to the system at this point. Now, talking about trust, IT leaders and IT in general, it always has been a pet peeve for many of us that business does not see us in that light that we can actually help drive business, and especially when it is keeping the lights on kind of a situation. And it may not be truly that, but it's, it could be perceived in that way. Would someone who is into executive management and actually running the show and all the eyes of, uh, um, of Wall Street and other shareholders are on the CEO and CFO, but not on a CIO usually. And if that is the case, are they able to put their job on the line and listen to a CIO? Well, if, if I could address that, I think sure. it isn't necessarily that we want to put them in a position where they're putting their job on the line. What we're doing is we're enabling the activities of the line business units to, you know, in our case, make and distribute motion pictures. And so the, the financial systems are crucial to them. 
distribution systems and production systems all support their activities on a day to day basis. And I, I don't and from our perspective anyway, we never see ourselves as putting anyone at risk by having a good plan and great execution. So we we don't ask them to put themselves in that position. Yeah, and I think I, what I would add is that um, what you're seeing is a, a generation of executives that are learning more about technology and how to use technology. It might be from their kids, but they are learning. Um, and we talk about it as, as, you know, sort of the IT savvy executive. Um, and that is what makes the difference in the company is with if you have enough IT savvy executives, you know, you're, you're jointly making those decisions. So it, it is becoming less of, a, of an us and them, and it's actually more of a partnership around what are the most important things we need to do, you know, to move the company forward. And frankly, I don't care that I'm not on the, you know, on the forefront and on the calls. As long as we get the uh, bottom line results that we're trying to accomplish, we all win together. So, I think, Pat, you used the critical word, which is we. Yeah. You know, we make sure that that every project is driven by the business of this company and is not an exclusive IT project. Exactly. When it comes down to executive management and there is an evolution like the way they saw IT and the way IT leaders saw IT themselves. So if we saw a similar economic downturn, say, a decade ago, what would have been a typical wisdom that they would have used to take the next step to kind of address it versus today? And if whatever that is, how is that was how was that interpreted earlier given the relationship and the amount of faith we had or executive management had on IT versus today? How has that changed? So I guess the way I see it is that, you know, a decade ago um, there were still most companies that saw IT as an expense to be managed, just like equipment or, or anything else, and a lot of it is equipment. So, so the mindset was, um, you know, how do you wring the last nickel out of it? You know, what I'm seeing now is, in fact, uh, the executives trying to figure out how to use IT uniquely to drive their business results and, in fact, thinking about, even during the downturn, and maybe especially during the downturn, how do I free up some uh, capital to spend more on IT or at least the same on IT so that I can get the business result that I'm looking for instead of looking at, at, at IT as an expense, we're now looking at it as a strategic sort of weapon almost in, in uh, you know, competing. Definitely we've moved beyond the it's nice to have and, you know, the sort of meat acts. No more upgrades, no more this, no more that, to, you know, let, let's go over the projects and investments we're making to make sure that we're getting, you know, that we're focusing on the important things in this downturn. Because the business landscape has clearly changed. So you cannot keep your old plans without revising and studying them and making sure you're doing the right thing. But uh, I definitely feel that we're no longer getting the, you need to make a 20% cut, boom. Um, it's more of, like, let's go over this, make sure that we're doing what we need to do during this downturn to position ourselves during the downturn and when we come out of the downturn. So have you taken an inventory of of the typical type of wisdom that, you know, I'm just repeating my question is to, that was the earlier portion of the question was more to see what would have happened and what is happening today in, in reality if we really were to take an inventory of executive management of many of those companies and what they would have spoken to their IT uh, leaders, what is the typical, um, well, you can say, directive given? Or are they saying, come collaborate, let's figure this thing out together? Oh, I definitely feel they say, that come can collaborate, that they know that IT has a special um, expertise in process and project management and in how to make an investment for the company. And we work together side by side as to what we're going to do and how we're going to adapt to the changing economic landscape. And, in fact, I'd add the, the other expertise that we bring is we actually get to, because everything seems to funnel through us, so we get to see some of the inefficiencies that may not be visible if you're in one department so, or one business unit. So we get to see what happens in the white space 
Um, and they're looking to us to bring that forward and, and create transparency to that so that we can become more effective as well. And that, that isn't necessarily an IT-specific role. It's because of the unique position we hold within the organization that we have that information to share. That's very well put. We in HR are two of the few departments that span the whole company and see it at a process level. Yep. So if we are at such times which we have not seen before, at least I never saw this in my lifetime, the kind of meltdown that we saw, and um, in, the, in the environment which where the whole there's a global impact, how are the, the IT leaders looking at it? And frankly, are they not nervous? I don't think we can uh, listen to the news or read a, a newspaper without being nervous. Um, so. I think that what it just forces us to do is to sharpen our pencils and become even more attuned to the changing landscape, work with the business that also see it in terms of revenue changes and buying pattern changes, work directly with them. So it's nervous time, but it's also opportunity time to you know see what we can do to differentiate ourselves from other companies that may indeed you know be using old thinking. How can we leverage ourselves past them? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, you'd be, you know, insane not to be nervous, but at the same time, it's, it's you know, necessity is the mother invention. It's the times when, when stuff gets really tough that the leaders emerge either with a new uh, way of doing something or a, a new thought process, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, is, is the thing that changes, you know, events in history. And uh, not that I'm expecting to change events in history, but I will tell you that same kind of thing. You sharpen your pencil, and it really becomes a rallying point to maybe do some things that you got a little sloppy about or you got a little comfortable about. Um, and when it's uncomfortable, you really start to push yourself to do things that maybe you didn't think you could do uh, and or didn't feel you needed to do in the past. So it's actually uh, kind of energizing, frankly. One thing we've had great success is, is going down in the, you know, into the technical ranks of IT and just bluntly saying to people, you know, things have changed. What do you see and what do you think? Because they work with the business side by side and as well as with their IT colleagues across the company. We're getting some great, uh, you know, input about ways we can improve specific processes. And uh, I think that that's doing nothing but improving the company for today's economic times and for the future. How much of immunity do you think an IT leader can get or should get in these times so that while they are nervous but they are still capable and, and to some extent executive management is looking up to them to bail them out, at least partially, then are they really being given the assurance that if you do mess up, and that could be a mistake, an honest mistake, you may have tried hard, you will not lose your job? So that's another thing which is on IT leaders' mind today. Yeah, we actually heard that at the conference um, in, in terms of people really being uh, across the board, being nervous about losing their jobs and afraid to make any mistake. And it's up to, frankly, it's up to senior management to create the right environment around that um, because if people are afraid to take a risk, then you're, you're never going to get this kind of change that you really need to have happen or you really have the opportunity to happen. Um, and I think it comes from, you know, the senior leaders. So, it, it, you know, it's me with my business partners kind of linking together at, at a shared objective of bring us out together um, as opposed to maybe pointing at one or the other. So the more that you can get the team, they were in this together, the better off, I think, uh, your results become. Yes, the magic word, we. Let's take a quick break, listeners. We'll be right back after these messages and talk about the on-demand computing world that is being created where we can, you know, shut down the valve and, and you know, just basically not pay any more for the time being and then uh, do a little more when we have the need. So basically you are creating an on-demand uh, spending on IT. Now, if you've already, you know, totally completed the implementation and you are living that awesome but at least is that helping you in this downturn so that you can stop some of those services stop using some of those services and and you know get by and uh, if suppose you are in middle of that transition do should we should you complete that so that you can eventually start taking care of uh, you know the, the downturn and by having this valve that you can shut out shut off once you have 
uh, completed that implementation. So let's talk more about that on-demand computing world. Has that been a good thing for companies in this downturn? And if they're in transition, how do they go about it? Should they complete it right now or they just put a stop to it till the time we get back and we have an upturn? Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Talk about his money. Call us toll free 866-472-5790 and talk to the experts. We talk talk money money all all the time. Voice America Business. Looking for flexible ways to scale your IT efforts? Then visit www.aval.com today. Aval helps companies find the global IT talent they need to align their IT and business objectives. Whether it's hiring top IT leadership talent or building a reliable technology team, Aval delivers. To find out how Aval can help your company, visit www.aval.com or call 1-800-947-2832. Aval, delivering global IT talent. That's www.aval, A-V-V-A-L, aval.com. Visit today. Technology is changing the way we live our lives and how we do business. On CIO Talk Radio, we talk about the benefits of technology and the great things it allows us to do, as well as its risks. Heard every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Pacific, Sunjo Gall interviews business leaders and other experts that are shaping the way we use technology. To learn more about this show, visit www.ciotalkradio.com. Keep up with the changing world of technology and listen to CIO Talk Radio with Sunjo Gall. Listen in every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Pacific, right here on Voice America Business. The Internet's only all-business and financial radio network, Voice America Business. You are listening to CIO Talk Radio. To learn more about the show, please visit www.ciotalkradio.com. If you have a question or comment, call toll-free 1-866-472-5790. Now back to the show, here's Sanjo Gall. Welcome back. Uh, so the question is that since we are moving, and in some cases we have already moved to an on-demand computing world, and in fact I would like to change that to an uh, on-demand IT world where we are computing on demand and we are bringing resources on demand and has that been a good thing if we have already made the transition but if we are in middle of that transition should we just you know uh, put a stop to it or we should complete that transition and then scale back and and basically scale back and or up based on whether it's a downturn today or an upturn tomorrow so Leo what do you think well I think that one of the things about moving to an on-demand world for us is like many of our initiatives it's driven by becoming more efficient, more cost-effective, and be able to provide better service to the business. So the on-demand projects that we have, we're planning on moving forward with. We're, uh, of course, always you know, examining everything as to whether or not the savings and uh, the efficiencies we expect are going to be there. But we see no reason to turn back from that, that uh, the reasons to do it during a uh, upturn are the same as the reasons to do it in a downturn. So we're definitely uh, looking at it, definitely focusing on it. And with the changing economic environment, I think it's it's easier to work with the vendors towards more and more cost-effective or more what I call throw weight for each application. So uh, we're not changing our plans there at all. If anything, we're uh, putting it under even more scrutiny. Brad, what do you think? Sort of a different view of that when you think about the human resource part of this. Um, One of the things that we were uh, starting and I think is even more urgent now is um, our structure uh, created a a way of um, uh, making people uh, very good in the domain so that we were very tied to our uh, business and, and helping drive business results. Unfortunately, that creates a bunch of inefficiency in the system because of that domain um, peak and valleys in their demand, and that doesn't matter if it's an internal or an offshore, there's still sort of peaks and valleys, and what we're now trying to do is, is sort of recapture that capacity across and find ways to, um, to schedule and uh, train and move resources around, and we think that there's 
um, some efficiency and some um, ability to recapture uh, work hours through doing that um, so that we do become and we look at ourselves as an on-demand um, human resource machine as well. So uh, one of the things we're looking at I think is really critical right now. Now, um, if you were to uh, look at the current downturn that we see, do you think we can just have people be helped in the sales side of things? Because, um, you know, people want to shut uh, or basically reduce the expenses that they're having, so a closer look, some sort of a business intelligence that we can do to figure out where all they can save money and we go beyond the regular uh, insight that we have been providing. And secondly, on the other side, can we help them in increase sales? And could IT make a direct impact there? They already are supporting the sales software, for example, but can they do something better here? You know, I think, and a lot of companies are doing this now, but the real key uh, from an IT perspective to help in sales, and I, and I would add sales, you know, add-on sales and service because all of those uh, will either bring in customers or keep existing customers or existing customers buying more um, is, is in better use of our data. So, you know, we are the stewards of an awful lot of information about not only, the, you know, the customers themselves but their, their patterns and, and the general public. And when you do good analysis around that, you can create much more efficiency for your sales force, for your service reps and so on. Um, in getting and keeping your best customers and, and add-on sales. Yeah, we definitely see a tremendous interest and in, uh, increasing demand from our sales force. They, they are really coming to us asking to know more about their customers and know more about the products, which products are profitable, where are they selling, how can they uh, best leverage what it is that we have to put on shelves. And I think that uh, we all view that as definitely helping the whole sales process. I think the interesting thing is in good times, um, you can afford to be, to have a certain level of inefficiency um, and you live with that during down times, you simply can't afford that inefficiency and so better use of our data is, is a way to get at that and, and we're seeing that increased demand because of it. The uh, old archetypal vision of a, a salesperson as being somebody who you know, really sort of flies by the seat of the pants is definitely gone. Yep. That the sophisticated sales organization is really targeted, really focused, knows exactly what's happening out there in the field and exploits that. Now, one of the problems that we saw when we had heydays is that we wanted to do everything that's possible with respect to optimizing IT creating value through IT, and we took way too much work in one shot and kept our plate more than full. It was literally spilling. And that sometimes becomes the very reason why you're not able to get the ROI for the IT investments. So if you were to take a look at this to be uh, like a you know, blessing in disguise, that now that we have a downturn, we have to shed some projects and that would actually allow us to give a very focused effort, put in a very focused effort, and thus get a better ROI on those initiatives than, than before. Do you think that is a good way to look at it? Well, um, we or is that true? Yeah, we definitely see that. We, we in IT management, we have discussions about you know, the business wants to get here. And they're getting more, they're getting better and better and rather than saying, I want this specific solution, they say, this is where we want to get. And we're sitting down and saying, rather than developing something new or buying a new package, how close can we get with the tools that we have at hand? And, um, you know, so then the ROI, of course, is, is quicker and uh, better. Um, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes things have changed too much or the tools you have are for a different period. Um, but definitely there's a, a real focus on with the business of how can we exploit the data that we have, how can we exploit the systems we have, how can we exploit the processes that we have, and then go forward from there with the changes that we need to make to accommodate the new business environment. Yeah, and I think the other thing, and I think it's absolutely a good thing, um, I think the other thing is not only having a tighter focus on, you know, what is the ROI of this particular project, 
how soon do you get the ROI because time really means a lot now. But I think the other thing that is starting to happen, um, and sitting down here in, in, uh, in Orlando around Disney, it, you really see it, which is a laser focus about what it is your company is about that's different from any other company. So I, I think what happens is in the heyday is, you know, you put pen to paper and everything's got an ROI. Everybody knows how to write a good business case. Don't know that you get it um, at the back end. And it, with so many things going on, it's really hard to decipher which things actually got to the ROI um, and which didn't. And um, and you do tend to lose focus a little bit. So I think what's, what is a very good uh, thing is that now we're really having to be laser focused about what we're about that's different than anybody else. Well, sometime back we did a show which was a CIO dilemma, be a sprinter or a marathon runner. <laughs> and that was a dilemma because you could always be faced with this challenge of uh, looking in a myopic way of what is just coming in the next three to six months versus the long term. And we always had that battle. Has this downturn made it very clear that we should be a sprinter now? Well, yes, but you have to get to the end of the long race, too. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that are the, an- the best answer is probably it depends. Yeah. You have to balance you know, everyday activity today with the fact that at some point this is going to change and uh, you, know, you have to last um, this downturn and come out the other side, whether the downturn is short or long. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the easy answers that people want is is an either or, you know, I'm, I should either be this or I should be that, when I do believe to some degree it's got to be an and. So um, I think there are some things that you do need to hunker down and look for some short-term results to survive the downturn, but if you take your eye off the ball and, and don't think about what's going to come, you know, at the uptick, um, I think you'll lose it, or you, at least you'll lose the opportunity to take maximum advantage of that. So you really got to have both in your in your lens and and do the balancing act, which is you know what what great leaders do. And I think that uh, that's where our partnership with the business is important because they're asking about the here and now, but they're relying on the IT to be there with the when, so that um, you know we will tell them like yes, we could do this short term and it'll have this impact. But in five years, you know, we don't see this as a viable technology or a viable way of doing business. And that's, that's when you have the really intense conversations about today and tomorrow, and that's what the business is looking for from us. But then if you, if you have a gun uh, to, you, to the head, and uh, are you not kind of almost forced and or tempted to cut corners to meet the deadlines and be able to do justice to the project because many times, a successful project is not, in in reality, a true success. It is a perception that it was it succeeded because it was completed within that timeline, or within a given budget, whether it was low or high in the first place. And if you if you do not agree to cutting those corners, or it actually you are not cutting corners, you just got creative, but you did not want to do it and you wanted to go about doing it the right way, would you not be labeled as being too slow? And that could be one of the reasons why you could be let go. You know, absolutely, that is such a dilemma that we face every single day. And one of the ways that we've been um, working with our business partners to, and this gets back to the we, to jointly make those decisions, is to get a lot more transparent about the implications. Because I think what happened in the past is, as CIOs, we got a lot of pressure, as you said, and we're measured on success only by that project on that date and not the long-term consequence. And at the same time, we got beat up because we were too slow and cost too much because we put in some of those short-term solutions. So by having really good conversation and being transparent about the implication and saying, we all understand now the implication of this is now I have two things instead of one, and that's going to cost me more in the long run, and are we all okay with that? becomes a much richer conversation and, and a much better, I think, business outcome. And so then in those cases, you, you, you may either change the decision to focus more on the longer term or you may go ahead but with full visibility to what we all agreed was going to be, you know, less than optimal for long term and understanding the implications of that. I think we've, at least in our place, we've done a disservice in not giving enough transparency to the implications of the decisions that we're making. Well put. Would you have uh, uh, an IT leader today be a mercenary 
and an opportunist or a strategist. Let's stay tuned. Please, I will be right back and discuss. Money, money, up to date business and financial news. Money, money. Call now and get the financial information you need. 866 472 5790. 866 472 5790. Voice America Business. Looking for flexible ways to scale your IT efforts? Then visit www.aval.com today. Aval helps companies find the global IT talent they need to align their IT and business objectives. Whether it's hiring top IT leadership talent or building a reliable technology team, Aval delivers. To find out how Aval can help your company, visit www.aval.com or call 1-800-947-2832. Aval, delivering global IT talent. That's www.aval, A-V-V-A-L, aval.com. Visit today. Income Property Investment Talk with Peter Mosca and Dean Issa provides homeowners and investors eager to invest well in real estate the knowledge, resources, and tools necessary to generate significant wealth. Our focus will be the paradigm. Live where you want. Invest where it makes the most sense. Listen live to the brightest minds in real estate investment every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific on the Voice America Business Channel. That's Income Property Investment Talk with Peter Mosca and Dean Issa, where America learns to invest. The bottom line in business. Voice America Business. You are listening to CIO Talk Radio. To learn more about the show, please visit www.ciotalkradio.com. If you have a question or comment, call toll-free 1-866-472-5790. Now back to the show. Here's Sanjo Gall. Welcome back. So the question is, is a mercenary or an opportunist type of CIO and or IT leaders likely to be more successful in such times versus a strategist? I, I, I think that most business leaders are now savvy enough to understand that, that you know, a completely mercenary approach is going to have its downturns. It may have its immediate successes, but they're looking for someone who can balance the tactical day-to-day, we need to survive, we need to get ahead with the longer-term strategic viewpoint. And so every tactical decision that we make plays into our overall strategic direction and how we want to get there. Um, used to be that we would get direction from management that would be like, IT, just get it done. Or we'd get just an unsettling amount of uh, micromanagement, which the business eventually would just lose interest in. Now it's more of a hybrid. We want to get here. How do you plan on getting us there? Um, What is it that we and the business need to do to work with you and IT? And what does IT need to do to work with the business? So, you know, the idea of being like either a mercenary or just simply a long-term planner, there's places for those people within IT organizations, but the overall organization has to be balanced. But do you think at this time, at this juncture, is there an implied expectation Implicit expectation there? Well, I feel like I'm not in a place where I have, like, a gun to my head. So I feel very fortunate that way. And I know that a lot of people um, are in that position. And then my advice would be, like, you've got to make sure that you and the company survive first. That's job one. Um, But if you have the luxury of doing both at the same time and to think in both terms, even though sometimes you know you're making a long-term suboptimal decisions, um, you know, you just have to keep that broad perspective. I agree. I think, you know, um, we, sometimes it is an either or, and sometimes it's getting really creative about the and, and how do we further both causes. But I would agree with Leo that, obviously, um, it doesn't really uh, pay to have strategy when the company's out of business. So you certainly are going to have to be very focused on the here and now. Um, but I, but I do believe that in many cases, if you keep the strategic hat on while you're looking at the here and now, there are at least some places where you can advance both together 
and trying to do either one completely separately doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, I, I think, you know, back to my earlier comment about transparency, I think what has happened is, you know, we have tended to, uh, the business has tended, as Leo said, to say, just go get this done. I don't care about it. And I just, you know, want you to hurry up and do it. And we obliged. And now we're left with some things that we don't particularly like because we didn't get very strategic about it or we may not have as much reuse as we would like. And, and not only are, are we unhappy, our, our business is unhappy, and they're now looking to us to kind of help them out of that morass. So I think it would be, um, it would be foolish for us to continue that just do it behavior with again without having some transparency to the implications and making sure that we all believe that's the right uh, approach and not pushing ourselves to try and figure out how to do both at the same time as much as possible. If you go back to your crew or if you go back to your counterparts who are business unit leaders and or the business users, what are they expecting you to do as IT leaders? Um, and during this, uh, there's a know, downturn. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're they're clearly expecting that we do everything we can to support their business initiatives. That 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 is absolutely crucial. Um, and at the same time, you know, look out for them over the horizon to see what's coming. Like a business wouldn't have seen things like competing on demand five years ago, but IT could see the glimmers of it, and the past two to three years really you know start to engage with it. And that can have just tremendous benefit to the business. So it's that combination of things that the business is looking for. They're not asking for order takers anymore, and they're at, you know, at the same time they have to take care of the here and now. Yeah, I would agree. They absolutely are asking us to help them. Um, they're asking us to be incredibly um, efficient and effective in our own shops and they're asking us to help them do the same in their shops, and they're asking us to uh, help them understand how to apply, um, whether it's new technologies or, or even the technologies we have, um, to their business problems to make them more effective. They really are looking for help in that space. Now, to, to that, uh, what about your own crew? Because when we look at human resources, we did, did touch about the human resource side of it in terms of making it an on-demand, but now we have a different challenge, and the, and the captain of the ship is only as good as the crew. So when you are going back and looking at your own crew, what are, you, what are the strategies that you're using to realign them, to coach them, and be able to bring them on the same page so that when you are trying to implement a strategy, they are truly believing in it, and they are, in fact, instrumental in helping build that strategy in the first place, so the buy-in is, is there already. I think a couple of things. You know, it starts with having some, some really clear uh, strategies and goals for the company that everyone shares, and I mean shares to the degree that we all feel like we succeed or fail together, and that means everyone, every business unit, all of the IT folks, there has to be some common elements that people are connected to um, so that they can do their job every day and make decisions um, around that. I think, you know, one of the things that there's always a tendency to do is to reduce the amount of time and effort you put on development during downturns, and I think that, you know, we have to be very careful about that because, again, you know, thinking for the long term, you want your people connected and engaged and skilled and you really don't want, particularly when the uptick comes, you know, all of your staff to leave you. Um, and then the third thing is give them a stake in driving the results. So by, by creating an, an environment and an opportunity, and Leo talked about it earlier, and helping solve the problems, they know how to solve the problems. They know what's going wrong. They know what's going right. And they know how to do the stuff. And creating an environment where they really feel part of the solution just creates so much energy and so much, you know, uh, intellectual capital um, that really if you set that up in the right way with the shared goals, the development, and getting them engaged in the problems, it, it, it all works together, um, and you almost can just sit back and watch it happen. It's, it's magic, like Disney, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the key there, you hit it perfectly, which is communications. I know that I'm spending a lot more time on just communication, sitting down with development teams, infrastructure teams, and just talking. 
and they'll ask you, what are we trying to do as a business? What are we doing about these challenges? And um, that helps motivate and clarify for them what they have to do. But I just ask them point blank, is this working? Do you feel like we're making progress? And um, the answers are, are sometimes just astound you. Sometimes you get the, you know, the yes, but. And the but is we could be so much more effective if we could include these other business units into this project because their business processes are very similar. And that's having uh, just a dramatic impact because we're putting people together to push this whole thing through and not living with the old you know, business uh, divisions by product line or you know, channels and stuff like that. And then you've got to be the one to remove the barriers for these folks, whether it's the political barriers, the you know, previous structure barriers, the cultural barriers, because um, otherwise they'll quickly get disengaged when they see they really can't make a difference. So you know, the other role is, is removing all of that clutter and saying this isn't a normal um, time, so we're not going to do business in a normal way, and we need to challenge everyone to bring their full selves and, th and and then you have to let them do that. So you have to get those barriers out of their way. How do you uh, get these people to perform at the top most at the, at, in, at, on the on the top gear if they themselves are uh, thinking that they may lose their job? Because there is there are instances and there have been organizations where even the IT crew was was reduced. And that's a that's a real um, a real possibility. And I think. The way you get top effort is when people feel that they can make a contribution that's actually going to make a difference. So none of us have job security, um, never really did, never will. Um, it, when you get disengaged and disenfranchised and you don't put your energy in is when you feel like it doesn't matter, when you feel like your voice isn't heard or when you feel like no matter what I do, my fate is out of my hands. If you start to put the fate back in their hands, and you start to allow them the opportunity to participate and make a difference, that is, the, that is the way that they will keep their jobs. And they'll be very engaged in it because they can see, you know, their um, contributions making a difference. Um, and so it becomes, a, you know, a positive cycle of engagement results and, and peak performance. And peak performers have less worry about losing their jobs. So I think it's a, yep. it's a positive cycle you can create. You know, the, the people know that jobs are hard to come by outside the company. And so the, I really emphasize to them that their best career move is to do as good a job as possible now. That now is when, you know, it will make all the difference. So luckily I have not had uh, to make draconian cuts. But, you know, the staff knows that what's going to help them the most and help the company is just the best performance all the way around. As a CIO and or as an IT leader, can you be likable and effective at the same time, especially in these times? You don't I want to look so. like an alien for sure. Well, I, you mean like uh, uh, you know, there, there are people whose management styles are more uh, aggressive, right, uh, confrontational. Um, I think that you can be likable and be respected um, while delivering um, bad news. And I think that that has to do with how you do it and how you maintain your professional demeanor. Absolutely. I think if, if you are doing your job with integrity, if you are very transparent about what's going on, if you're keeping people informed, if they feel like they're part of the process, we actually did go through it, and it's interesting. Um, we did, uh, because we had many this kind of lack of focus and we are spending money on a lot of different things, we actually um, last year really uh, tried to focus and, and say these are the most important things. And we did end up having to downsize our staff, um, not significantly on our onshore staff, but relatively significantly on our offshore staff. Um, but the two combined, it, it was done in a very short time, and it was, uh, we were concerned, but we had people involved all along the way, they understood why we did it. They understood why we needed to do it as a company. They understood how we were going to handle, you know, where people were affected and not affected and why. So there, were very, there was a lot of participation in the process, and I have never seen anything go quite as smoothly 
Um, and we really didn't miss a beat. People were delivering every day, not even knowing if tomorrow they were going to have a job, and yet they were meeting their dates and they were, you know, meeting their commitments. So um, it can be, you can do things that feel, you know, like tough decisions um, and be respected for it if you do it in a respectful manner. Let's take a quick break, break, listeners, and we'll be right back after these messages and look at what is a true um, character and or a style, as, as uh, Leo mentioned, of management that an individual has, but what would work in these times. So if you are, say, a feeling person or someone who is, or versus someone who is a task-oriented and or idea-oriented person, can you really wear that mask for long and still be effective? And especially in these times when people are watching every move that you make and every decision that you make very closely. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back and discuss. Stocks, bonds, 401ks, investments, refinancing. We can help you. Call now toll free. 866-472-5790. 866-472-5790. Voice America Business. Looking for flexible ways to scale your IT efforts? Then visit www.aval.com today. Aval helps companies find the global IT talent they need to align their IT and business objectives. Whether it's hiring top IT leadership talent or building a reliable technology team, Aval delivers. To find out how Aval can help your company, visit www.aval.com or call 1-800-947-2832. Aval, delivering global IT talent. That's www.aval, A-V-V-A-L, aval.com. Visit today. Income Property Investment Talk with Peter Mosca and Dean Issa provides homeowners and investors eager to invest well in real estate the knowledge, resources, and tools necessary to generate significant wealth. Our focus will be the paradigm. Live where you want. Invest where it makes the most sense. Listen live to the brightest minds in real estate investment every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific on the Voice America Business Channel. That's Income Property Investment Talk with Peter Mosca and Dean Issa, where America learns to invest. Best. Tune in every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time for The Growth Strategist with Aldana Ambler. On the show, Aldana and some of today's top business professionals will discuss some of today's most pressing business issues that hold you, the business owner, back. Aldana will also give you 21 ways to grow with her list of growth strategies. Grow smart, grow profit, and grow your business with Aldana Ambler and The Growth Strategist every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Right here on the bottom line in business talk, Voice America Business. The Internet's only all business and financial radio network, Voice America Business. You are listening to CIO Talk Radio. To learn more about the show, please visit www.ciotalkradio.com. If you have a question or comment, call toll-free 1-866-472-5790. Now back to the show, here's Sanjo Gall. Welcome back. So uh, before we get into the idea versus a feeling type of person, a different style of management an individual has, I have a question for you, Pat. Out, IT outsourcing is, is big time being done in your organization and, 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 in fact, in many other organizations. Is this the time to really increase that even more? Um, so I guess the, the one thing I would do is I would put um, politics aside because I think that may have some bearing on our answers as we go forward in terms of what we believe is a nation. So if you put that aside and think simply in economic terms for the company, um, what outsourcing or offshoring both really do for you is that um, on-demand resourcing. And so I think it absolutely has to be a big part of your strategy. Um, that's one. And the other is what it also brings is a different talent pool. And I think, you know, anyone would be foolish to not think that we are a global community and we need to look at the global talent pool from which to pull. So I think there's a couple of really important reasons to continue that 
Um, it's going to be an individual organization where they are now uh, decision, I think, to decide whether that's a grow, stay the same, or maybe even less. But I think it, it will continue to be a strong part of, of uh, you know, sourcing strategies for all of us going forward. If somebody's not yet entered into uh, the outsourcing arena or not joined that bandwagon yet, do you think this is a time they can toy with it? It always depends. It depends upon what's going on in your business and how much uh, time and latitude you have to implement an outsourcing strategy. I don't think, uh, especially in trying times, it's difficult to give categorical answers um, because you don't have the, the buoyant business environment to lift you no matter what you do. But if it makes sense for you and uh, it's where the business is going, then now is as good a time as any. But that, that really has to be made in conjunction with the business to understand what you're doing, why, and how, and what are the pluses and what are the minuses. Like anything else, there's no quick fixes to any of our problems. So if you're thinking, now's the time to go in because I'm going to save a bunch of money, you know, in 2009, you're definitely going in with the wrong attitude. Um, you really have to think about, again, as Leo said, what's my business circumstance? What am I trying to get out of this particular um, arrangement? And then, you know, do I have time to get there or not? And, and what are the risks that I'm going to face? And then make a good business decision around it. So there aren't silver bullets, and, um, you know, each decision has all kinds of positive and negative uh, potential implications. With respect to communication, uh, IT leaders and also other business unit leaders are trying to communicate with their people, and there are three flavors or there are three generations that we have which coexist, which is baby boomers, Gen X, and Gen Y. Are you actually customizing your messages today, or you are giving the same message, hoping that they will interpret them based on what they bring to the table, a set of values, and the, the environment that they have been brought up in? I think that the uh, change in business climate has definitely focused a lot of people. And if you have a very straightforward message based upon the, the business climate, that you know we're doing the following projects, you know, because we're trying to uh, improve our market penetration in this area or reduce costs in that area. My experience has been, because we have lots of all the generations, a lot of young people go to the movie industry, that they follow that and they appreciate your direct honesty. I don't try to uh, hip it up or hip it down depending upon the different people. It's a serious time and there's serious messages. And people, I think, appreciate that integrity and honesty. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't think we customize the messages, but we consider the fact that we have this broad uh, audience uh, with different needs. Um, and so there are certainly different media with which we communicate, um, different venues. And I think the, but the core that I think everybody shares is, you know, really wanting to understand what's going on, what's my part in this, and how can I make a difference? And then also understanding um, how, uh, you know, how my voice is being heard in, in the larger. So people really want to feel like they contribute. We see it more with the younger generation. I think that the, the older folks like us are, uh, uh, do have grown up a little bit in a, you know, kind of listen and do what I'm told and may not push as much. Um, but you still want to contribute. So I think that key message that, that comes across is everybody does want to feel like they matter and they want to feel involved in the process. Um, so that cuts across generations. They might act on it a little differently, but I, I think the more you leave open forums and places for people to interact, um, you can get at that core across all the different generations. I think it's very important to have a, a trust-based by communications, both directions where people can tell you, I don't understand, or this doesn't match what I think. Um, I think that that's very effective to do. And, and we literally ask people, does this make sense? Do you, do you understand what we're talking about? And uh, sometimes then, you know, that provokes conversation between the different groups and uh, helps people see things forward. On behalf of the show and our listeners, I'd really like to thank you, Pat and Leo, for sharing your thoughts about how... IT leaders today can realign uh, their IT and the communication and any other strategies that they may be implementing 
for the downturn related uh, challenges and actually be ready for the upturn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Now, this downturn is unlike others that we've seen over the last few decades, and it has had a global economic impact. This is the time when IT can really help keep businesses afloat by contributing in the best way they can and even drive innovation within the limits of the budget that are allocated. Yes, we have a crisis in hand, but we should look beyond it and be ready for the upturn. IT leader cannot do this alone. So we need to appeal to our respective crew that we need the IT and the non-IT workers to provide all the help and support and understanding and that will allow the IT leadership to plan and implement strategies for now and the future. So how is your IT leadership contributing in these troubled times? Please send us your thoughts to views at ciotalkradio.com. That is views at ciotalkradio.com. Thank you again for listening to CIO Talk Radio. This is Sanjog All, your talk show host. Till next week, take care and God bless. Thank you for tuning in to CIO Talk Radio. To learn more about the show, please visit www.ciotalkradio.com. Join Sanjay Gall next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Pacific for another hour of CIO Talk Radio.